Subscribe our channel and press bell icon to get the notification of new video. Like this video. Join our WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1 You will hear a woman booking a room for a party at a community centre. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Hi, good morning. My name's Pete. How can I help you? Hi, my name's Maria Lincoln. I understand you hire out rooms in the community centre as venues for parties? Yes, we do. We have various sized accommodation. It depends on what you're looking for, really. We're looking to hold a party, a children's birthday party, and we need a room that will hold about 70 people, with space for a small disco area, games, dancing and food. Well, we have a large room, and it would certainly hold at least 100 people comfortably. It's used a lot for parties and things like that. That sounds as if it might be suitable. I've tried various venues, and they're either booked up or they don't hold enough people. Can you tell me when you were thinking of holding the party? I know it's short notice, but we wanted to hold it Saturday week. That's September 15th. Well, let's have a look. Uh, hmm, yes, you're in luck. The Mandela Suite is free then. I'll just write that down. M-A-N-D-E-L-A. -E and the time. When were you thinking of holding it? In the afternoon, from 3.30 p.m. to 9.00 p.m. Yes, OK. There is no smoking on the premises, and we're only licensed to have soft drinks. Oh, that's OK. I think I'm happy to go ahead. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Can you just give your postcode? Yes, it's PA57GJ. Fine. And the flat and street number? It's flat number 40 and the street number is 35. OK, so that's flat 40, 35 Beaches Street. Yes, that's right. And a contact number? My landline is 223279 with the code. But I'll give you my mobile number, which is 07897293381. OK, 293381. Um, can you tell me how much it will cost? It's quite reasonable, actually. It's £115 for the hire of the room, with tables and chairs. But if you want to hire disco equipment, we've got a basic system with speakers and other equipment for £25. But there is no technician around in case anything goes wrong. And, of course, it's optional. Oh, that would save us carting something from home, but maybe we should bring a spare sound system just in case. We've never had any problem with the system, but you might not want to take any chances. What about catering? Well, 
we had thought of getting everyone bringing something. We have someone who can do catering for nine pounds a head, including the cake, if required. That's handy, but it's a lot, as we have a fairly tight budget. So, you want to go ahead with the booking? Yes, certainly. OK. I need to take a deposit of £30, which is refundable. The balance needs to be paid two days before the event at the latest. Fine. You can cancel up to two days before, but after that you lose the deposit. We don't intend to cancel, but is there any insurance we can take out? Yes, there's a, a form here somewhere. How much? It's, uh, oh, let me see. It's only £9 for the 24-hour period, and that covers you for cancellation, damage and injury. Well, at least we'd better have a look at it. How would you like to pay the deposit? Cash. I'll just give you a receipt. Uh, there you are. Ten, twenty, thirty. Thirty pounds. Uh, Maria Lincoln. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm really glad I found somewhere. We have been trying to book a place for the past two weeks, so thank you again, and uh, bye for now. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a guide giving instructions to a group of international students in Canada preparing for a whale watching trip. Before you hear the talk, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions 11 to 16. Hello everyone. Glad to see so many happy faces on this wild and windy day. Are you all ready to go looking for whales? I'm Tony and our other guide today is Dale. We'll be using these two rubber boats you see here and our trip today will take three hours. In a few minutes, we'll be heading into part of the largest temperate rainforest of the Pacific Northwest. I'll show you our route on the map here. This is where we are now. We'll be leaving the sheltered bay and heading out across the mouth of the bay toward the open water. As you know, last night there were strong winds in the area, so we can't go out into the ocean as we had planned. Near the mouth, the water will be quite rough. That's where we are most likely to spot orcas, or killer, whales, as they are also called. After crossing the mouth of the bay, we'll enter the calmer, shallower waters. This is where you look for grey whales. Then we will continue up this narrow inlet, close to the shore. You will have a great view of giant fir and cedar trees that have never been logged. Here is the place to watch for wildlife. You are likely to see bears along the shore and eagles in the sky overhead. Right at the back of the inlet here are the hot springs where we will be stopping for an hour. You can have a soothing soak in bubbling hot water before the return trip. I'll tell you a little bit about the whales now because with the noise of the wind and the engine you won't be able to hear much out there. As we head out in the boat we will probably see dolphins first. They are a grey colour and quite small, one to two metres long. They will swim right beside the boat, 
racing along and sometimes jumping out of the water just ahead of us. They swim very fast, and they are playful and curious. They're really fun to watch. The next ones we'll see are orcas, or killer whales, which are actually members of the dolphin family. They are seven to eight meters long, very fast, and they have sharp teeth. Some stay in these waters all year round. We identify them by the distinctive black and white color. They feed mainly on salmon in these waters, but the orca diet can include seabirds, seals, dolphins, and other mammals. They can be fierce hunters, and this is why they are called killer whales. We should start watching for them as soon as we get out toward open water. We're likely to spot the orcas from a considerable distance. Watch for the black and white marking and mist spouting from the blowholes on top of their heads. Just outside the inlet, is where we will probably see gray whales. The grays are migratory. They pass through here twice a year, moving from far in the north where they feed to the warm southern waters where they breed. You are very lucky today because several have been reported in the area. Unlike the orcas, grays are solitary, except when you see a mother with a calf. The gray whales are much longer and heavier than the orcas, 14 meters long and weighing up to 30 tons. The gray whales are filter feeders, gathering tiny ghost shrimp from the sand at the bottom. We recognize grays from their tail fins because each one is different. Once we find the whales, we'll come up as close as we can safely. We are allowed to approach the whales no closer than 50 meters, but that feels pretty close when you are in the presence of animals this big. You'll see mist coming out of the blowholes when they breathe out, and you'll hear a loud hiss. If we are downwind, we might even be able to smell them, a strong, fishy smell. Before the talk continues, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now, as the talk continues, answer questions 17 to 20. Now, for just a few words of caution. It will be quite bouncy out there, especially in the front of the boat. If you want a smoother ride, stay in the middle of the boat, close to the engine. Hold on to the ropes and keep an eye on any big waves. Be alert so you don't get thrown out of the boat. In case of an emergency, you are all wearing survival suits. They'll keep you warm and dry in or out of the water. They are bright orange for visibility. The water temperature is around 8 degrees. Without these suits, you would only last a few minutes in this cold water. With these suits, your survival time is increased dramatically. They will keep you upright in the water even if you can't swim. But we don't expect anybody to end up in the water, so don't worry. Now, are there any questions? I'm afraid of getting seasick. Right. I was just coming to that. If you think you might get seasick, take one of these patches and put it on your arm at the wrist. Like this. It works on pressure points of the body and will relieve seasickness without the drowsiness you can get from pills. Are there any other questions? All right then, let's start loading up the boats. We leave in five minutes. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a student union officer's speech. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi there. May I wish you a very warm welcome to Ealing College, and more especially to the Student Union. The Student Union is run by four sabbatical officers, of which I am one. As the President, I am charged with the overall day-to-day -day running of the Union itself, according to established policies within the Constitution. We also have a brilliant staff team who'll help us and you'll meet them when you have five minutes to drop in and see us. The last year has seen the student union grow from incorporating a bar and a few offices with a small shop into being a thriving concern which controls, to its credit, two bars, a cafe bar or restaurant, a shop, a comprehensive welfare department and numerous offices. All this has been achieved by sheer hard work and dedication on the part of last year's sabbatical team and staff, who overcame many obstacles and teething problems, but won through in the end. This year, our aims as a team will be to consolidate on what has already been achieved and to secure the future of the Union. With the new post of Vice President Social and Communications, our main emphasis will be on communications within the College which has always proved a problem in the past, but one which we hope to improve upon this year. One way will be the regular publication of a student union magazine, so all you budding journalists come on down. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. We are very aware that a lot of you have never had any contact with student unions before and don't know what they are or what they can do for you. So basically, here's a quick rundown. If you have any problems at all, either when you start college or throughout your time here, don't hesitate to drop in in the SU office in the North Building and see Pat, our office assistant. She will be able to help you with most of your day-to-day -day general inquiries, or if she can't, she will direct you to one of our staff who can. Myself and the other three vice presidents are here every day, and if you need to see us, just fix a time with Pat, and we'll be only too happy to help you. By the way, queries or problems can range from a late grant check finding a place to live and academic matters, right through to the best places to eat, directions to the bar, or somebody blocking you in the car park. We'll give anything our best shot. Please remember, while you're at Ealing, that going to college is not just about education. Make sure you enjoy yourself as well, because believe me, time will fly once you're here. Ealing is a really good place to live, as there is lots to see and do. And don't forget, the metropolis of central London is only 20 minutes away by tube. Finally, the Student Union is an organisation run by students for students. So if there is anything you don't agree with, or you have any new ideas, please come along to the Union General Meetings and don't be afraid to speak up. Or, you could give up a little of your time and stand for the Executive Committee, 
which is made up of students who help us out with lots of interesting things. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the sabbaticals of the last two years who have worked so hard. My very special thanks goes to Winston, Martin and Peter and all the staff who not only did a great job but have been my good friends as well. Lots of luck and success for your year at Ealing. Work hard, but play hard as well. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear an extract from a talk about preventative medicine. Specifically, how students can look after their own health. Listen to what the speaker says and answer questions 32 to 40. First, you have some time to look at the questions. Now listen carefully and answer questions. Good morning. I'm Dr. Pat Parker, and I'm here to talk to you about preventative medicine in its widest and most personal aspects. In other words, I'm here to tell you how the patient should wrest control of their health away from the practitioners of medicine and take charge of their own medical destiny. I want to talk about staying out of the hands of the doctor. When the patient takes responsibility for her or his own health, and let's decide the patient is male for now, men are in fact more at risk than women anyway, when the patient takes over his own health regime, he must decide what he wants to do. The first thing, of course, is to give up the demon nicotine. Smoking is the worst threat to health and it's self-inflicted damage. I have colleagues who are reluctant to treat smokers. If you want to stay well, stay off tobacco and smoking in all its manifestations. Our department has recently completed a survey of men's health. We looked at men in different age groups and occupations and we came up with a disturbing insight. Young men particularly working-class men, are at considerable risk of premature death because of their lifestyle. As a group, they have high risk factors. They drink too much alcohol, they smoke more heavily than any other group, their diet is frequently heavy in saturated fats, and they don't get enough exercise. We then did a smaller survey in which we looked at environmental factors which affect health. I had privately expected to find air or water pollution to be the biggest hazards, and they must not be ignored. However, the effects of the sun emerged as a threat which people simply do not take sufficiently seriously. Please remember that too much sunlight can cause permanent damage. Given this information, and the self-destructive things which people, particularly young men, are doing to themselves, one could be excused for feeling very depressed. However, I believe that a well-funded education campaign will help us improve public health standards and will be particularly valuable for young men. I'm an optimist. I see things improving. But only if we work very hard. In the second part of the talk, 
I want to consider different things that you as students can do to improve your fitness. So now I'd like to issue a qualification to everything I say. People will still get sick, and they will still need doctors. This advice is just to reduce the incidence of sickness. It would be great if disease were preventable, but it's not. However, we have power. In the late 80s, the Surgeon General of the United States said that 53% of our illnesses could be avoided by healthy lifestyle choices. I now want to discuss these choices with you. You should try to make keeping fit fun. It's very hard to go out and do exercises by yourself. So it's wise to find a sport that you like and play it with other people. If you swim, you can consider scuba diving or snorkeling. If you jog, try to find a friend to go with. If you walk, choose pretty places to walk or have a reason for walking. Your exercise regime should be a pleasure, not a penance. The university is an excellent place to find other people who share sporting interests with you. And there are many sports teams you can join. This, unfortunately, raises the issue of sports injuries. And different sports have characteristic injuries. As well as accidental injuries, we find repetitive strain injuries occurring in sports where the same motion is frequently performed, like rowing and squash. The parallel in working life is repetitive strain injury which may be suffered by typists or other people who perform the same action hour after hour, day after day. In this context, therefore, the most important thing to remember before any sport is to warm up adequately. Do stretching exercises and aim at all times to increase your flexibility. Be gentle with yourself and allow time to prepare for the game you have chosen to play. Don't be fooled by the term warm-up, by the way. It's every bit as important to do your warm-up exercises on a hot day as on a cool one. I think one of the most sensible and exciting developments in the reduction of injury is the recognition that all sports can borrow from each other. Many sports programs are now encouraging players to use cross-training techniques, that is, to borrow training techniques from other sports. Boxers have been using cross-training for years, building up stamina by doing road work and weight training while honing their skills and reflexes. Other sports, which require a high level of eye-hand coordination, are following this trend. So, you see table tennis players running and jogging to improve their performance, and footballers doing flexibility exercises, which can help them control the ball better. All of these results are good, but the general sense of well-being is best, and is accessible to us all, from trained athletes to people who will never run 100 metres in less than 15 seconds. Good health is not only for those who will achieve athletic greatness. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.